Hello everyone, welcome to another virtual planetarium tour hosted by Roberson Museum and Science Center. Uh, my name is Christina and I'm going to be your guide for today's program and you may have noticed by my awesome background that this is a special version of our virtual planetarium tours because this is a RobberCon edition. Um, you can see I'm coming to you live from Hogwarts today and that's because today's program is going to be um, Harry Potter and its connection to astronomy. So primarily what we're going to be looking at are some celestial objects that are directly related to some of the Harry Potter characters throughout the series. Um, we'll get a little bit more into what that means in just a minute, but before we do, um, I just want to mention that um, two things. One, I highly recommend watching our first virtual planetarium tour that's available on our Facebook page and our YouTube page because there are a lot of really great pointers in there um, about how you can follow along if you're planning on doing your own stargazing later tonight. Um, some pointers on how to find which direction you're facing um, and how to make your way through the constellations um, and find some things just above the horizon. So, like I said, if you have the time to watch the first one, I totally recommend. If not, you're still going to get something uh, useful out of this program today, and you can still do some stargazing on your own tonight. Um, the other thing that's really important to know is that this uh, program is specifically developed to represent um, the evening of September 27th uh, from Binghamton, New York. So right here from our very own location. If you are tuning in from another location or at a later date or time, some of these things may vary slightly. Um, things will adjust throughout the evening sky as time goes on, so please do keep that in mind. Everything won't be exactly as I describe it if you are from another location or like I said, a future date and time. So that being said, let's jump right into it. Um, the first thing you'll notice is around the perimeter of our horizon there, we have a simulated landscape, um, and that's just so that you can basically have the realistic feeling of having some obstacles blocking your view of the horizon. We're going to remove that today so we have a nice clear view all the way around with nothing blocking out any of the stars that we want to take a look at today. Um, and we are also going to make note that what we're looking at right now is the evening of September 27th at sunset. So sunset is 6.51 p.m. We're going to fast forward a little bit, blast through sunset so we can get that out of our way. You can see the time is speeding up there down to the southeast as we fast forward, get the sun to set and have our stars come out. And we're going to stop here at just about 8 p.m. Let's see, 7.56. We'll stop there. Um, when the sun is beneath the horizon and we have a nice clear view. So, like I said, today is all Harry Potter themed. What we're going to do is we are going to go through some of the Harry Potter characters that have been named specifically after constellations or stars or other celestial bodies. And we're going to talk about how the origins of the name could be directly related to the characters and their character traits, perhaps. And I'll also throw in some other astronomy tidbits along the way, um, give you some fun facts about that particular constellation or star, and um, some other things that will be visible. So like I said, mainly Harry Potter, but there are some other really cool things that will be visible tonight, so I'll point those out to you as well if you just want to do some general stargazing outside of, um, you know, the Harry Potter nerdiness of it all. So, first things first, we are going to bring in our constellations here. So, uh, we have the option to cheat a little bit and uh, connect the dots for you so that you can see the constellations clearly uh, when you go out at night. Obviously, this is not the case, but this is just a guideline so that you guys kind of have an idea of what things will look like. So, when you go to do the real deal, you have some background information. Okay, great. So we're also going to label the constellations so that you can see their official titles here. So when I say a particular name, you know where we're looking. And the first one that we are going to start with is a character that's a little bit more obscure, and that is Cygnus Black. Um, this is the uncle of Sirius Black, who is obviously a very, very well-known character, one of my favorites, um, probably very beloved by all of you. 
and um, we are going to take our eyes towards the center of the sky for this one. If you can see my cursor moving here, I'm circling this particular constellation right there, and that is Cygnus, named for where Cygnus Black's name comes from. Um, easy way to find this, two things about it. One, uh, it resembles the shape of a cross, which makes it pretty easy to spot in the night sky. It's a very large cross. It's actually also known as the Northern Cross, um, and it's directly located in the center of the sky, or almost directly located in the center of the sky at about 8 p.m. on this evening. So what you're going to want to do is look directly above you to zenith. So zenith is the point in the sky directly straight above in the center of the sky. You're going to find your zenith, and you should be able to find signal very near to that. The other way you can find Cygnus is by, uh, if you're in a location with the appropriate sky conditions that allows you to be able to see our Milky Way galaxy, which is this hazy strip cutting through the center of the sky here, it actually lies right along the center of the Milky Way galaxy here. Um, so if you can see your Milky Way galaxy, you can find that, and then you can also um, have a good indicator of where you should be looking for Cygnus as well. So, um, Cygnus is meant to represent a swan. The constellation is meant to represent a swan. Um, and like I said, he is Sirius Black's uncle, but he is uh, also the father of Bellatrix Lestrange, uh, Andromeda Tonks, and Narcissa Malfoy, the three sisters, who we'll get into a little bit more later. I probably should have prefaced this tour by saying that um, this tour is going to be really the who's who of the Black family or the House of Black um, because it was tradition in the Black family for the children to be named after celestial bodies or objects. There are a lot of constellations and star names in the family. So we're going to be going through quite the Black family tree here today as we uh, breeze through our night sky. Okay, so let's bring in our constellation art here for a moment so that you guys can see Cygnus the Swan in all its glory. There it is. Cygnus the Swan, what it's meant to represent. I uh, happen to also think that Cygnus the Swan, if you remove the artwork, kind of looks like a stick figure dude shrugging his shoulders. So you can use that as a guideline to try and find that constellation as well. Okay, the next thing we're going to be looking at today. So we're going to be talking about um, one of Cygnus's nephews or Sirius Black's younger brother, Regulus Black. And um, we're not going to focus on his first name just yet. We'll turn back to Regulus in just a minute. But his middle name is Arcturus. Arcturus. Uh, we're going to be talking about his middle name first. So if you direct your attention to the west, I'm actually going to label our stars because Arcturus is a star. So you probably noticed I just popped in some new titles here and um, they are different colors and they are smaller text than the constellation name. So that's an easy way for you to be able to differentiate between what is a constellation name and what is a star name. So Arcturus is located almost directly to the west this evening and it is visible to the naked eye. Um, Arcturus is actually the brightest star in this constellation over here. The constellation of Boots. So you can look over to the west, find the brightest star in the constellation of Boots, and you'll be looking at Arcturus. And this is actually the third brightest star in the entire night sky. So again, very visible, very easy to find uh, if you're looking almost directly to the west. Another really great way to find this particular star, I'm going to give you a little tip here, is to use the Big Dipper. Again, if you haven't seen our first sky tour yet, I absolutely recommend it because I give you tips on how you can find the Big Dipper. But uh, it's very large and it's very easy to spot normally. It'll be over here uh, to the north this evening. You can see here is the bowl of the Big Dipper and this is the handle here. So it's sort of hanging out upside down. What you want to do is you want to use the Big Dipper's handle or the end of the bear's tail if you're looking at Ursa Major as a whole. And you're going to follow through the final three stars of the handle here and you're going to arc to arc Taurus. If you draw a nice big arc line up through the handle and make an arch shape over down, you'll find your way straight arced down to Arcturus. So that's a really great way to find that. Okay, moving along, we're actually going to take our direction to the 
other side of the sky. So if you could turn your attention over towards the east, now we're going to be talking about Andromeda. This is Andromeda right over here. You can see sort of connected to Pegasus. It almost looks like one large constellation and that's because these constellations um, are directly related to each other in the Greek mythology that they originate from. Um, but in terms of the Harry Potter character, this is where the name of Andromeda Tonks came from. So Andromeda, again, is the son of, or excuse me, daughter of Cygnus Black, mother of Nymphadora Tonks, who is later married to Remus Lupin, and we'll be talking about those characters a little further down the line. So with Andromeda, uh, she is also sister to Bellatrix and Narcissa, who was disowned from the Black family for marrying not a pure blood wizard, unfortunately. Um, so yes, Andromeda Tonks, we know her all too well. Now, let's take a look at this constellation. If we bring in our artwork, you can see that she is the fair maiden, Princess Andromeda of Greek mythology, known for being chained to a rock to be sacrificed to a sea creature, uh, thanks to her mom. Um, in Greek mythology, and she's later saved by Perseus, who's over here just beneath her, who saves her on his winged horse, Pegasus, who you'll see just above. So the whole story kind of carries through right here along the eastern horizon. Okay, now the other thing that's very interesting about this constellation is that the name Andromeda is also directly linked to the Andromeda galaxy. So we're going to take a little trip uh, to M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. Let's take a closer look. Here we are. Okay, so this is an image of the Andromeda Galaxy. This is a spiral galaxy that is actually our closest galactic neighbor. This is the closest galaxy to our very own galaxy here at home in the Milky Way. And it's very similar to our own home galaxy as well. This is a spiral galaxy, just like the Milky Way, but this is actually about twice the size of the Milky Way. The Andromeda Galaxy is known to have um, about one trillion stars, a whole bunch, one trillion stars, which is double the amount that's known to uh, be in the Milky Way galaxy. So it's very, very large. And the other interesting thing about the Andromeda galaxy is that it's actually on a collision course with us. It's on a collision course with the Milky Way galaxy, our very own home. So they are set to merge with one another in about 4 billion years. Uh, luckily, we won't be around to see the action, but uh, that is set to happen. Okay, the other thing about the Andromeda Galaxy that is incredibly interesting is that technically it is visible to the naked eye. So like I said, it's our nearest neighboring galaxy and it's one of the brightest deep sky objects in the entire night sky. Um, it's the most distant object from us that's visible to the naked eye. Um, now, that being said, that is if you are in the most ideal night sky conditions, incredibly dark, no light pollution, um, and if you have great eyesight, I suppose. Um, I highly doubt I would be able to find it, but it does appear in the night sky as sort of a glowing, cloudy, faint haze, if you will. Um, but like I said, it is visible to the naked eye. Even if you have a pair of binoculars, you can probably head on out, find Andromeda, and look towards that for the Andromeda galaxy. You might be able to get a good view on a nice clear night. Okay, let's come on back down to Earth. Jump out of our galaxy here and move along. Okay, so the next constellation we're going to be looking at today is that of Draco. Uh, yes, Draco, the infamous Draco Malfoy. So if you look to the north, you'll be able to find Draco. And something that I talk about in our first sky tour is circumpolar constellations. Draco is a circumpolar constellation, which means that it never dips beneath the horizon. So as we move through night throughout the year, um, Draco is always visible throughout the entire night. It will never dip beneath the horizon. It's always constantly visible because it's located closest to um, Polaris, which is our north star. So as we rotate on our axis, 
the North Star is the central point located directly above the Earth's axis. So anything that's located really closely to the North Star will always remain visible as we rotate. Um, that includes Ursa Major, Cepheus, Cassiopeia, all of these um, constellations that are located generally just around the North Star, which is right here directly above the northern horizon in uh, Ursa Minor or Little Dipper. Okay, so just here you can see we have Draco and you probably notice its shape. It's an S shape, which is very interesting, almost resembling a snake, if you will. Uh, Draco is Latin for dragon, so if we bring in the artwork, you can see that it clearly does resemble a dragon. Um, and it's also in the Hogwarts crest. Draco is included in the Latin of the Hogwarts crest, meaning dragon. Um, but in Greek, Draco actually translates to mean serpent. So I find that very interesting. Obviously, Draco Malfoy's affiliation with the Dark Lord, the Death Eaters, and of course, Slytherin House. So very fitting name, I think. <clears throat> okay. Now, moving along towards the very end of the Deathly Hallows, we get to meet some of the main character's children, and that is where we meet Draco Malfoy's son, who he has named Scorpius Hyperion Malfoy. Now, I love this name because there are two celestial objects in there, the first one being Scorpius, the constellation. I'm going to have you direct your attention downwards now towards the south. If you're looking down towards the south here, you'll find the zodiac constellation of Scorpius. That may be some of your zodiac signs out there. So we've got Scorpius just down here, just peaking above the southern horizon around 8 p.m. So as we move through the night, we will quickly lose it. It will dip beneath the horizon and set, so it won't be visible for very long. You'll want to go out early in the evening, like I said, around 8 p.m. to be able to catch this one. Um, so you can see, even without the artwork, that it clearly represents a scorpion. We've got the scorpion's tail and stinger looping around back here. And towards the front, we've got these prongs that almost represent the uh, scorpion claws. <clears throat> Um, and this is actually one of the oldest known constellations, which I find very interesting about that one. Um, okay, so let's see here. Oh, before we move on, um, one more tip about how to find Scorpius. Again, if you're in a location where you're able to clearly see the Milky Way, um, this portion of the Milky Way down here just above the southern horizon, that is the brightest, that is the center of the Milky Way, the heart of the Milky Way. If you're looking there, you're looking directly towards the center of our galaxy. Galaxy, which is why it's so bright, because it has the highest um, density of stars located there. So if you're able to find the Milky Way where you are, Scorpius is located directly in front of the heart of the Milky Way. So if you can find that just above the southern horizon, you should easily be able to locate that constellation as well. <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to back away from our constellations and even our stars here for a minute, and we're going to turn our attention over to our planets. So uh, on this particular evening, we've got quite a few visible planets in sight, which is very exciting. There are five planets that are visible to the naked eye, and around this time, three of them will be above the horizon. So um, Jupiter and Saturn, if you look directly to the south, are visible just down here. Pluto is sort of hanging out between them, but Pluto is not visible to the naked eye. Um, so you won't be able to see that, but you will clearly be able to see Jupiter and Saturn. So Jupiter will be shining brighter than the surrounding stars, so it's very easy to point out. Again, you want to make your way to south um, and look directly above the horizon, and you should easily be able to spot Jupiter. And then Saturn should be very easy to find as well because it will be so closely located to Jupiter. Once you've found Jupiter, you can find the other brightest object that's nearest to Jupiter this evening above the southern horizon around 8 p.m. to be able to get a glimpse of both of those planets. We're actually going to talk a little bit more about Saturn here as we continue to talk about Draco Malfoy's son, Scorpius. So let's take a closer look. <clears throat> Now, as we fly out to Saturn, we're going to stop a little bit, a little ways away, because 
just uh, beneath Saturn there, you can see that there are, well, there is one moon in particular we're going to talk about, but you can see three of Saturn's 53 moons. It has 53 moons in total, but the one we're going to focus on is just down to the left there, and that's Hyperion. That is Scorpius Hyperion Malfoy's middle name. And that is one of Saturn's moons, and we are going to take a closer look at it. Here we go. So in this rendering, um, there's not too much going on with it, not all that exciting, and it looks almost uh, perfectly spherical here. And in actuality, it's not. I highly recommend you looking up some photos of Hyperion. They're very interesting and kind of fun to see because it's almost, um, it's very irregularly shaped, but it almost looks like a potato which I find pretty funny. So I absolutely recommend taking a look at that so you can see the Hyperion potato moon uh, that Scorpius Malfoy is named after. Okay, let's bump out a notch again. And um, while we're here, might as well take a look at Saturn. There it is in all its glory. You can see Saturn and all of its rings and a few more of the 53 moons. Okay. So let's come back down to Earth now that we're done talking about Scorpius. And the last thing I want to point out while we're here, actually there are two more things we can talk about while we're here. The first one is the moon. So the moon will be located about southeast at this time on this evening. Obviously you guys all know what the moon looks like. Super easy to find. I don't have to tell you how to do that. But um, worth noting is that on this evening the moon will be in a waxing gibbous phase. So it will be um, almost fully lit. So it will be very easy to see. And we actually are going to have a full moon on October 1st. So if you enjoy the full moon, October 1st is going to be your day um, next week to head on out, take a look, and check out the full moon. Um, okay, let's bump forward in time just a smidge more and stop right about there a little bit before 9 p.m. at this point. And I want to stop here because at this time, oh, let's pause our time there for a second. At this time, if you look almost directly to the east, this is when you'll be able to see Mars. This is the third visible planet that I talked about being above the horizon this evening, almost directly to the east. Mars is super, super easy to spot. So again, at around 9 p.m., almost directly to the east, find that bright glowing object just above the horizon. And it's also really easy to find because it glows with almost a reddish orangish tinge to it. So it is easy to differentiate between um, Mars and the stars that are surrounding it. Again, I have some pointers in the other star tour that tell you how you can tell the difference between uh, planets and stars, which will help you out with this a little bit too if you're planning to do some stargazing um, and some planet gazing this evening. Okay. Let's move along. We are actually going to fast forward even more in time throughout the evening. We're going to blast through. Let's bring in our constellations here so you have something to enjoy along the way. We're going to blast through the evening. We're going to head almost through the entire night because it just so happens that the way this is, is broken down for where we can see um, these Harry Potter characters is that they're all either visible at the very beginning of the night or at the very, very end of the night this evening. So we're going to go all the way through, watch our constellations rise and set, rise and set as we get through to about 4.45. Whoopsies. We went a little too far. Sorry guys, let's come back a notch here. That's what happens when you hit the wrong key. Okay, so here we are, 4.45 a.m. and this is where we're going to pick up on our tour. <clears throat> now keep in mind this is the morning of September 28th, which will be a Sunday. And if you guys are awake this early, good for you. I am not, <laughs> but if you are, you'll be able to check out what we're going to talk about next. So the first thing is we're going to actually backtrack to Regulus Black for a minute. We talked about his middle name Arcturus earlier with the star. We're going to focus on his first name now because that will be visible. This is also a star, and this star is located in the constellation of Leo the Lion. So if you look directly to the east at this time, around almost 5 a.m., you'll see the zodiac constellation of Leo the Lion over just above 
the eastern horizon. I'm going to remove the artwork here for a second just to show you something. Um, a really uh, easy way to find Leo the lion, a tip that I like to use, is that his head resembles a backwards question mark. So you can see this hook shape here, even with this star at the end forming the dot, um, is sort of a backwards question mark. And I think that makes it really easy to identify that constellation. And if we bring in our star labels, you'll see that that dot at the very bottom of our backwards question mark here represents the star Regulus, who we are now talking about. So the star is often known as the heart of the lion. You can see that it's at the very front and center of the constellation here, almost where the lion's heart would be located. Um, and I find that to be very interesting considering Regulus's background. So we know that um, Regulus was the member of Slytherin House at Hogwarts and that he later went on to become a Death Eater and a follower of Lord Voldemort. Um, but we also know that he later changed his mind. He had a change of heart, if you will, and he, uh, his one, one of his final acts was to go against Lord Voldemort, um, and he was very brave. He was very courageous, and those are often characteristics or traits of a member of Gryffindor House, which is represented by a lion on the Hogwarts crest. So um, some might even say that Regulus was meant to be a Gryffindor all along because he clearly was very brave, very courageous, and so I find it very fitting that the star Regulus is located in the constellation of Leo the Lion. Okay, let's move along, <clears throat> and we're going to talk now about Regulus's cousin, very infamous, the very well-known, the very loved and hated, I think, Bellatrix Lestrange. So, Bellatrix is, again, if we go back through the Black family tree, um, she is the uh, cousin of Sirius uh, and Regulus, sister to Andromeda, Narcissa, and daughter to Cygnus Black. Okay, so uh, this uh, star, she's named after a star, and she's located in the constellation of Orion. If you look down towards the south, you'll find one of the most prominent southern constellations, Orion. Everyone knows and loves Orion. Very, very easy to spot because of Orion's belt, um, located directly in the center of this particular constellation. The three consecutive stars are really easy to point out. And once you've found Orion's belt, then you know you're looking at the constellation of Orion. And now, unfortunately, Bellatrix is actually not a particularly bright star in the grand scheme of things. Bellatrix is the third brightest star in this constellation, in the Orion constellation, but not so bright in comparison to the entire night sky. And if I remove the artwork here for a second, you'll see that it's not even labeled because of that. Um, the star Bellatrix is actually this one right here that makes up Orion's right shoulder, um, or I guess left shoulder, <laughs> makes up one of his shoulders here. Um, that's where you'll find the star Bellatrix. So really not one that you'll be able to go out and find easily, but we obviously can't move along without talking about it. Um, so this star is often known as the Amazon star. Um, Amazons were obviously well known for being female warriors, and I think that's very fitting to the character of Bellatrix. She's obviously a fighter. She's a fierce and loyal follower to Lord Voldemort and one of his most um, skilled and deadly Death Eaters. So I think that it's very fitting that she's named after an Amazonian star. Um, let's see here. Uh, the other thing that I like to point out about Orion, um, which is a little bit lesser known, is that uh, Sirius and Regulus Black, their father's name is Orion. So he was named after this constellation here. Okay, moving along, we are now going to talk about Bellatrix's cousin, Sirius Black. Yes, I promised we would come back to him. So, Let's talk about him really quickly. Um, like I said, his father's name was Orion, which was uh, where his name came from, was this constellation right here. And if you follow down to the left of Orion, you'll come upon this constellation here, which is Canis Major. 
And this was known as uh, one of Orion's faithful hunting dogs, which is why Candace Major is always following along closely on the heels of Orion. So we've got the father, Orion, and then within Candace Major, we'll find the son, Sirius Black. Directly at the heart of Candace Major is where you'll find the star Sirius, which is where his name comes from. You can see the label is right here at the heart of this constellation. Now, this is my by far favorite Harry Potter connection to astronomy. This one is just so incredibly fitting. Okay, ready? So, Canis Major, this is known as the Great Dog. If you look at the artwork, you can see it is in fact a dog, like I said, Orion's hunting dog. At the heart of Canis Major is the brightest star in the entire night sky. Sirius is by far the entire, uh, the brightest star in the entire night sky. Very, very, very easy to locate. You guys can absolutely see this one with the naked eye. Um, Sirius actually translates to mean glowing because of course, like I said, incredibly bright. Um, but it's also known to be called the Dog Star because it's located in the constellation of Canis Major being the Great Dog. And of course, we all know that Sirius Black, his Animagus, is a large black dog. I mean, come on, could that not be more perfect? Um, so Sirius Black, Animagus is the dog or Padfoot, um, and that comes from the dog star in the constellation of Canis Major, the great dog. It's perfect. Poetry. I love it. That's by far my favorite. Um, again, that is the hunting dog to Orion, which is Sirius Black's father as well, which is also very fitting, very nice, I think. Okay, so while we're here, we're going to turn off our constellations again here for a moment. And aside from Harry Potter, the last thing that I want to show you in tonight's night sky is going to be to the east. And that's Venus. So backtracking to our planets here again for a second. This is when you'll be able to see Venus. About 5 a.m. directly to the east, you'll find Venus. This is another one of the five uh, uh, planets that are visible to the naked eye. And this is the brightest of all five. This is the brightest planet, the by far easiest to find. Again, make your way to the east, look above the horizon, and you should be able to easily pinpoint Venus if you're awake, again, if you're awake, if you're feeling like going out and having a look, there it'll be. Um, okay, now the last character that I wanted to talk to you guys about is um, Remus Lupin, of course. Well known, very beloved, and he's also named after a constellation. But on this evening, the constellation he's named after is not visible in the evening. You will not be able to go out and see it at night. Unfortunately, those stars are above the horizon during the daytime when the sun is also in the sky, and obviously the light uh, doesn't allow you to see it. So what we're going to do is we're going to move through sunrise here and just get the constellation above the horizon so I can show it to you and you can see what it looks like. Again, this is not something that will be readily available for you to see. Um, so let's remove our planets, bring in our constellations once more, and fast forward through the morning. Here comes the sun. So we're going to move through until about, I think the constellation comes up at around 1.30 p.m. So let's speed it up a little bit here. Yes, here we are. Speed up a little bit more. So around 1.30 p.m. is when this particular constellation rises above the horizon. And we're just going to turn off the sun for a second. We're just going to cheat a little bit and pretend the sun's not there. And if you were to do that, you would see directly above the southern horizon which again would probably be very hard to see because of all the real life obstacles like trees and buildings and whatnot that don't allow you to see directly above the horizon. Um, but that's where you would find the constellation of Lupus. Let me bring in the artwork here for a second. There it is. So Remus Lupin has two fitting names. His first name is Remus, which comes from the story of Romulus and Remus in Greek mythology. Um, they were the founders of Rome, and in that story, they, those two brothers were actually raised 
by wolves. They were raised by a wolf mother whose cubs had died. So Remus is a fitting wolf name, of course. And then Lupin comes from the Latin lupus, which this constellation is here, which means wolf. So you can see there is a wolf constellation, and we all know that Remus Lupin is in fact a werewolf. So Remus Lupin, it all makes sense. He is the wolf. Um, and that's where those names come from. Again, so sorry you won't actually be able to see these things, or just this one. We cheated a little bit, but we couldn't move along without talking about Remus, of course, right? Um, and that brings us to the end of our tour, everyone. So there you have it. All of our Harry Potter characters that were named after stars, constellations, moons, we took a look at all of them and they will be visible to you tonight. So please um, get out there, do some stargazing, take these notes with you and check some things out. Um, we will be doing some more virtual planetarium tours for you guys, so stay tuned. We've definitely got more coming your way on our Facebook. Um, until then, I hope you guys enjoyed this very much. Um, please do some stargazing, come back and see us again, and thank you so much for watching. Bye guys!